I'm going to give an update on our project optimizing eDNA monitoring for multiple AIS that I've been working on uh, for over 18 months now uh, with the project team. I'm Josh Dumke from the Natural Resources Research Institute. I'm co-leading this project with Gretchen Hansen from the University of Minnesota, Dr. Chanlan Chun, who is running the lab operations up here at NRI. Chris Rounds is a graduate student at the main U campus um, being advised by Gretchen. Anna Toch is a graduate student working up here at NRI with Dr. Chanlan Chun. And Eric Larson is over at University of Illinois. So we have a great team of uh, highly experienced people working on, on this interesting project. So the general um, point of this work is we have a map of Minnesota listing a lot of invasive species presence locations. And the question is, is this accurate? Do we have this fully captured for all of our species? It's likely no. Um, the product invasive species continue to spread among Minnesota water bodies, and we really need to know where they are in order to slow their spread. If you don't know where they are, you can't introduce any actions. Um, AIS early detection using traditional methods requires substantial investment, which limits the number of lakes surveyed, and that's one of the problems why we may not know fully where everything is. And physical detections may still lag years behind AIS establishment. And that means missed opportunities to prevent their spread, either through taking actions or um, just notifying the users of boat launches nearby. So how environmental DNA can help, or eDNA, as I used throughout this uh, presentation. eDNA can screen for many species from each sample. eDNA may perform better than traditional methods when invasive species numbers are at low densities. And eDNA sampling is relatively inexpensive and is conducive to widespread monitoring, especially if you broaden the group of people taking samples, such as lake associations or community scientists. And that's a theme that I will uh, circle back to at the end. So before we go through um, what we've done and what we're finding, I need to give a little bit of a synopsis on what I mean by eDNA sampling. So it starts with collecting a water sample, at least in the premise of what we did in our project. There are other ways to get water samples and to get the DNA from that water. But I'll go through what we were doing as the majority of our sample processing for this project. So you go to a lake, collect a water sample, you filter that water so that all of the suspended uh, bits of DNA and algae and all kinds of things that was in the water get stuck onto this filter. That filter is cut in half. Half of it is saved as a backup or an archive, and half goes on to extracting the DNA from the filter using a Kygen DNA Easy Kit. And that happens in the lab. Then from that extracted DNA, it goes through PCR. This is where you have the um, primers and probes of our target organisms, where we're trying to amplify any of the target genes for those species if they are in the sample. If there's amplification, that's what we call a positive or a detection. And if there is no amplification, that means that that string of um, DNA primers probes were not amplifying anything in the sample. Therefore, that DNA was missing from the sample. So it's a non-detection or a negative result. So how do we maximize AIS detections using eDNA? To get the most out of eDNA monitoring for multiple AIS, we need to know two things. The first is when and where should we collect water samples, which is our first objective, and Chris is going to talk about that next. And also, we need to know what combination of methods maximize DNA yield. And there's many components to that, and that's where I'll pick up after Chris goes through objective one. So Chris, I will let you take over talking. Sweet. Thanks, Josh. Just making sure you can hear me. Yes. Awesome. Um, so yeah, I am a graduate student uh, focusing on objective one of this project. Um, and so as Josh mentioned, uh, objective one is kind of really focused on um, like when and where eDNA works best. Um, so uh, a large focus uh, of this project is, um, of this objective for sure is uh, how we can kind of uh, figure out where in a lake we can uh, sample best and uh, when we can sample best. Um, and by sampling best, I mean maximizing our ability to, to detect aquatic invasive species. 
Um, so we focus on four uh, AIS for this project. Um, kind of these are widespread and also known to have pretty uh, detrimental impacts on lakes. Uh, so we focused on zebra mussel, spiny water flea, rusty crayfish, and common carp. Um, and so the real uh, overarching purpose of objective one is to determine how uh, the seasonal timing of sampling, the influence of different lake characteristics, and the location of uh, samples can influence our probability of uh, getting these AIS detections. And so you can see on these two figures down here, this is uh, fake data, so um, you know, take it as you will. Uh, but you can see like this is uh, what we might expect for some of our aquatic invasive species. So looking at this red line, we have carp where they kind of slowly decrease in our ability to detect them over time. And we might think of this as because carp spawn in the spring. So earlier in the year, they're more detectable. And then uh, throughout the year, they become less detectable. Um, similarly with zebra mussels, they kind of get to uh, they're releasing villagers in the summer. They're kind of um, just releasing all this stuff into the water, getting more active in the kind of mid late summer. Um, and so they might be more detectable at that time. Uh, spiny water fleas kind of reach peak abundances in uh, kind of late summer, early fall. So that's why you see this peak here. Um, and so we can translate uh, the ability to detect um, these aquatic invasive species into the number of samples that we need uh, to take to have a 95% probability of detection. Um, and so what we're looking for here is uh, where all three curves are kind of at a, a really low value. So this would, uh, you know, we would uh, need the least amount of samples to have a 95% probability of detecting all of our species here. And at this uh, point, you can see, you know, it would be something like five samples, uh, which, um, yeah, and uh, this is kind of what we're going to end up doing with uh, our four species once we uh, have all of our data back. And so, Josh, you can move on to the next slide here. Sweet. So getting more into the uh, study design of objective one. Um, so we we have a bunch of different lakes, all with known uh, populations of uh, these four aquatic invasive species, and we visit each of these lakes five different times throughout the open water season. So kind of like <clears throat> April to November ish, um, and <clears throat> at each lake visit, we take uh, fourteen different water samples. So the uh, ten samples that we kind of focus on in this talk are for uh, environmental DNA. Um, and then four samples, uh, which are at um, the same points that we take eDNA uh, samples at, are used for the analysis of major cations and anions. And then we have one sample that we kind of carry around with us to the field, which is just for a uh, field blank. And that's kind of a uh, quality control, quality assurance kind of thing to make sure that we are uh, not having any kind of contamination or anything like that in the field. Um, so you can see this map of Lake Phelan here in the metro area. So each of these 10 uh, points is a point where we would take uh, eDNA samples at. And then these uh, points that also have black squares um, are points where we would also take uh, the water quality samples at. And so we take these back to the lab. And as Josh uh, showed photos of, we filter them, preserve them. And then we uh, extract the DNA from these um, filters, and we can um, use qPCR to quantify the amount of DNA in each sample. And next slide. So our current progress for objective one is uh, we have finished sampled, sampling 13 lakes, which we did in 2021. And we have just one more sampling event on eight different lakes uh, for this year. Um, so uh, pretty much done with field work, getting really close. Uh, maybe give us another month here and we'll be completely finished. Uh, DNA extractions are really far along. We're about 85% complete, and we just pretty much have to do uh, this last sampling event for DNA extractions. Uh, QPCR um, is getting also pretty far along. Uh, it's about 30% done. We've pretty much uh, gotten all the way through CARP, and we are uh, getting to other species now. Um, 
And we are uh, kind of really quickly generating a lot of this uh, qPCR data. So we have someone kind of running multiple uh, qPCR runs uh, pretty much daily. So uh, lots of stuff coming out. And you can see uh, this little map of our lakes that we uh, that we sampled. So a lot of lakes in the metro area uh, and then kind of lakes throughout greater Minnesota. And next slide. Um, so preliminary findings for common carp, uh, we really haven't had uh, a bunch of time or ability to uh, start modeling this yet. Um, so this is kind of our raw data here. Uh, so we have um, six lakes that we have completely finished the uh, qPCR for from 2021. Um, so there is five visits for each uh, lake over the open water season. So you can kind of see there's like a little bit of clumping here uh, that corresponds to each of the five visits. Um, so 10 eDNA samples collected for visit, which is uh, why there is up to 10 on the Y axis here. And you can see there's a little bit of um, variability throughout uh, the year. Um, and that is kind of as we thought maybe due to uh, CARP just releasing a little bit more DNA at certain times. Um, and I would uh, kind of say that this is uh, not really like uh, those other graphs you saw. This is just a raw kind of number of PCR hits that we got. Um, versus the other graphs are uh, kind of like what would be modeled outputs for our detectability. So um, you can see here uh, that like even if we have, you know, one uh, positive detection, we can kind of take that as uh, like assuming that we have no contamination or anything like that, that um, that is a positive for that lake, right? So we have uh, some way or another found um, CARP DNA in that lake. Um, next slide here. Um, so our uh, kind of application of our findings that we'll have for objective one is uh, kind of um, really importantly uh, where or when we can sample um, to kind of maximize our ability to detect. So if you're going to be going out to a lake and you want to know, um, you know, what kind of uh, or like what AIS we have in this lake, um, when you can kind of get the most bang for your buck in terms of sampling. Um, and then also physical and chemical uh, characteristics can be pretty important in um, eDNA sampling. So um, we uh, are going to be looking at, um, and this is where a lot of that cation, anion stuff comes in, uh, kind of what uh, water quality parameters are going to be more uh, conducive to effective eDNA sampling. Um, you know, sometimes uh, people think clear lakes are going to be uh, you're going to uh, have less stuff inhibiting PCR or stuff like that. Uh, so um, looking at that as well. And then uh, also I talked about this a little bit, but we will be um, doing some detection probability monitoring uh, to look at how many samples uh, you know, we recommend managers take uh, to be able to get a, um, a good ability to detect aquatic invasive species on their lake. Um, and that is um, the end of that slide. Thank you, Chris. All right, I'll jump back on video. Um, so I'm going to move into objective two, and this is kind of building on what objective one is learning, but now we're doing a deeper dive into very specific method choices that you can make. And those are broken into two categories, field method questions and lab method questions. screen will move. There we go. Um, how much water to collect? That's a very basic question. Our standard um, baseline for this project was doing 250 milliliter surface water grabs. But what's the difference if you do a one liter surface water grab? Are you finding differences in the amount of detection rates or copies of the target invasive species genes based on water sample? Water sample volume, excuse me and the variable uh, variable in situ desiccant kits. So this is a totally different system. It's a syringe where you're filtering water on site through a little housing. That's a 25 millimeter diameter filter in that uh, little housing. After you filter your water to the point of that filter clogging, which could clog anywhere from 50 milliliters up to 250. Uh, that was our maximum for this, for this test group. 
Then you drop that filter housing into a baggie with silica beads. It's um, meant to dry out the filter and preserve the DNA through desiccation. So it's a totally different system. There's a lot of changing variables happening where it's not directly comparable to all of the other test groups. But I'm going to throw that in there as an interesting different way of doing this instead of water grabs, having these desiccant kits where you can filter water on site and then you don't have to keep anything cold. You don't have to add any preservative. It's lightweight. It doesn't take up much space. There's some advantages to a desiccant kit, but we don't know how well they work and how they compare against a more traditional water grab. And how uh, doesn't matter where you collect that water and mainly focusing on the di differences between offshore surface water and offshore benthic water. If you think about a species like rusty crayfish that's living on the bottom of the lake and you're over, you know, 30 feet of water, how effective is a surface water grab at a point like that? Doesn't matter if you take a Van Dorn, which could cost 500 to a thousand dollars, depending on what you um, choose to purchase, drop that down near the bottom of the lake and collect water that way. Uh, do we get any differences in, in detections by the um, vertical profile of the water that we're sampling? And how does eDNA detection correlate to invasive species presence? This is comparing eDNA results to traditional invasive species surveys. So if you look at the options, you could take a bottle of water or you could employ many methods um, that are relatively intense, depending on if you're looking for multiple species or just one. It can be easier to look for just one species, but if you're looking for three or more, you have to use many different methods because not all methods are effective for each invasive species. So when we were near shore, we were doing snorkeling, shoreline searches, horizontal zooplankton net toes because we were in shallow water, uh, trapping for rusty crayfish. And when we were offshore, we used horizontal zooplankton toes an underwater drone to view the lake bottom for rusty crayfish and zebra mussels, which did in fact work. And um, we dropped ponars when water clarity wasn't good enough to use the underwater drone to see if we were grabbing any uh, zebra mussels at depth. And we have lab method questions like, does filter pore size matter? We have test groups comparing the results between one micron and five micron cellulose nitrate filters. And does preservation and extraction method matter? Our standard for maybe 95% of our samples is to take that filter, preserve it in ethanol, and then later do an extraction with a Kygen DNA easy kit. There's another method where you take that filter and put it into a CTAB buffer solution and then do an extraction using a chloroform method. And there's a lot more to that. It involves a little bit more um, lab experience, but the CTAB buffer over time lyses cells and releases more DNA into solution. So it's put possible that that combination of preserving in CTAB and doing a different type of extraction may yield more DNA from an individual filter than the ethanol and Kygen kit extraction. But we're going to test that and see if it really does make a difference. Um, and does quantification method matter? Conventional qPCR versus digital PCR. Most of our samples, again, are all processed through um, conventional qPCR, but we have some paired test groups where we're also sending those samples through DDPCR to see if detection rates are different. DDPCR is a much more sensitive method uh, of quantifying DNA. So we might find that it would be better for early detection when you expect DNA um, to be at low abundances in lakes. And the start items are what I'm going to talk about today. So for our study design in activity two, we selected five lakes that have our target invasive species, the same invasive species as objective one. Uh, rusty crayfish, spiny water flea, zebra mussel, and only common carp in the St. Louis River estuary because the other lakes uh, were not known to have common carp. So we did include common carp just for the St. Louis River estuary. Ten points were sampled in each lake, just like in activity one. Five were near shore, five were offshore. But the difference is instead of visiting these lakes many times, we went once and we sampled, uh, we collected a lot of samples at one time. 125 samples collected per lake. They were mostly eDNA and field blanks. Four of those were for water chemistry, again, for cations and anions um, to meet the same 
uh, goals as the objective one. And uh, we had many paired eDNA test groups. So when we were collecting these samples, uh, we were collecting a lot of different test groups at the same locations at the same time with one different variable between those test groups. So we can tease out how the um, differences are showing up if you change water or you change a filter, for example. eDNA collection points were paired with traditional invasive species surveys. So while we had the boat anchored and we were collecting our, uh, our water samples, we would follow that up with a traditional invasive species surveys survey to determine if any of our target invasive species were detectable at those points using traditional methods. So here's preliminary findings um, looking at just one of the sites, the St. Louis River Estuary, which I should note is not the perfect example. It's not a lake. It's got a lot of mixing. It's uh, wind mixed. It's mixed with sage from Lake Superior. There is water current flowing uh, from up to downstream. So I'm not going to talk about any differences between near shore and offshore locations. Um, it's just such a well mixed system that I don't think there would be uh, much point to, to looking for those differences here. But the graph is going to start off with showing our sample points and where we had physical detections of rusty crayfish and there are no green triangles on the map. In our near shore points, we were setting crayfish traps. We didn't capture any uh, rusty crayfish in overnight traps. And our offshore use of the camera, underwater camera, was not very useful because the water was too turbid and the flow was too great. It was moving the camera around. So we did not detect any rusty crayfish when we were there doing our sampling. This is a comparison of our water volume test group. There was, uh, these paired test groups happened at five of the sample points. So I blocked out the five that we um, didn't collect these samples at the same location. And for each test group, there were three replicates at each point. So here are the results for um, eDNA positive returns from um, the one liter uh, water grabs from the surface filtered through a five micron, uh, micron pore size filter, excuse me, or the red dots, which returned five out of five points. Now that's seven out of 15 samples. And remember there's five points, there's three replicates at each. What that means is we were collecting three grabs at each point for a one liter surface grab. And one or two of them would come back as non-detections while one of them would be. So there's a lot of variability. It's uh, the DNA was patchy. So even five feet away, if you take the same type of water grabs, you were getting, a, we were finding a mix of uh, detections and non-detections. And there was one location where a 250 milliliter surface grab, also a five micron pore size filter, uh, detected rusty crayfish. That was one out of 15 samples. And the desiccant kit showed up as um, positive returns on two of the points, three out of 15 samples. So that's one of the things that was nothing in the desiccant kit was really um, the same as the surface grab comparison except they were collected at the same points at the same time. So we were getting uh, positive returns on all of the eDNA methods, but clearly more of them were from the one liter surface grabs. And for common carp, we're using Fish and Wildlife Service data that uh, was captured about uh, a week prior to our visit. They had done some netting and captured uh, common carp at two of the sample points that we were going to. Again, this is set up the exact same way as rusty crayfish that I showed before. These are paired test groups at five of the points. So I dropped the ones that we uh, didn't collect these water samples at the same locations. And this is the results the exact same way. One liter surface grabs are the red dots, 250 milliliter surface grabs are the purple circles, where two um, of the points were positive for common carp and one for the uh, 250 milliliter grab. And one was positive with the desiccant kit. And all three methods uh, made a positive detection at that sample point 10. So there was um, more carp DNA likely in that spot. Again, we don't know where the carp were when we took these um, eDNA samples. We didn't actually try to capture carp or um, sample them in any way ourselves. Okay, so a summary of our preliminary Gosh. I'm sorry, your audio has gotten pretty bad. Can we maybe try turning off your video just for the last little bit here? 
Oh, sure. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. Well, thank you for telling me. Um, so here's a summary of our preliminary math comparison data. All three eDNA test groups in this example detected two of our target AIS in the St. Louis River and performed better than traditional surveys for Ruxy crayfish. The greater volume of the one liter samples led to more detections, but there are practical limitations to transporting large volumes of water, especially if you have to take a lot of samples. Those have to fit into a cooler. You have to lift that cooler and move it around. Um, and there are issues with filtering one liter samples. They can clog, and then you have to deal with putting that volume of water through multiple filters rather than one. Um, desiccant kits appear to work about as well as the 250 milliliter water grabs, at least in this uh, small example. And this was just a small subset of data, which may not even be the best methods. And we have a lot of data analysis to do. The data is generating right now, but we have to still do quality control and then do our analyses. Our goal is to create method recommendations for the field application of eDNA when monitoring AS in Minnesota. So managers, specialists, and non-government organizations have guidance and confidence when using eDNA as a monitoring strategy. And one of our deliverables is going to be an eDNA best practices guide, which will describe our recommendations in plain language. So that would be in addition to our report uh, and planned uh, publications. And I also want to um, mention that we have a continuation coming up. So if you remember the desk and kits and how eDNA as a method could be used by supporting communities to collect field samples. Well, we have an upcoming MACER funded project to determine feasibility of a community scientist program for eDNA monitoring. And it's our project team and we're welcoming in Nectar to help us with networking. And that will be one of the biggest strengths that we'll, we'll have pulling this in. Yeah, pulling in the, the experience and, and knowledge of um, Meg. And in this project, we're going to be testing different filtering systems for a desiccant kit. So what we found was our little uh, syringe was difficult to push water through that small 25 uh, millimeter diameter filter. So we're going to switch to the kit that is um, provided by Smithroot with a filter that has a built-in desiccant housing. So you filter the water through that uh, housing and you drop the whole thing into a baggie and then you're done. Um, we need to do a little bit of in-house method testing to see which type of uh, system will work, but then we're gonna create remote training and instructional guides to hand out to uh, volunteers. And all the transfer of sample kits will be through the mail, uh, shipping things to volunteers and having them in prepackaged uh, prepaid envelopes to ship things back straight to the labs. And then we'll request feedback from contributing volunteers about their experience, hopefully to make, um, make adjustments and figure out where we could make improvements to make it a, a more reliable and better experience. And <clears throat> the data from the lab will be used to evaluate AIS detections from volunteer samples, including contamination rates. Can we get uh, usable data for research? In a, in a system like this, where we're re requesting volunteers set to take samples. So our outcomes would be eDNA sample kits and effective training materials and protocols for community members appropriate for a larger scale application. So up here is uh, my contact information and that of Chris Rounds. And I want to thank uh, MACERC and the Environment and Nat Natural Resources Trust Fund for supporting this project, C Grant, gave us the ability to use their underwater drone last year, and that was really helpful. And the Ramsey County Park and Rec Department um, has helped a lot with collecting field samples at a lot of metro area lakes. So thank you to everybody who's been um, showing interest in supporting this project, and thank you everyone for attending. All right, thank you so much, Josh and Chris. That was excellent and super interesting. Um, yeah, Josh, I think it's okay to have your video back on. It didn't really change things, but at least on my end, it was garbled, but I could totally understand what you were saying. So hopefully the message got through. Um, we have some questions here and we'll get through these. And then um, some of them were answered live um, during the webinar. And if there's time, we can go back to those in case anybody missed it. But um, we have a question from Luke Borgstrom. Um, he's wondering if the lake location 
is a variable in those detection curves or if it's just species specific. Um, and the reason why I was asking is if you have a narrow sampling window, will you have a difficult time sampling enough lakes to meet the needs or desires of early detection considering we've got over 8,000 lakes to deal with um, and it would require a very wide volunteer network. Right, and that's one of the things that we're going to hopefully use our um, distribution of study lakes to help help figure out. Is there anything with lake space, where lakes are distributed in the landscape? Is it just water chemistry? Is it just the species? We have four species in this project that we are um, using as our target organisms. There's a lot that we haven't done any optimization on to figure out when their DNA would be um, most available in the environment to capture. So there's still work to do with other species for sure. Okay. Um, and the next one uh, was about detection being less likely in midsummer through July. I think that was for the carp example. Um, and Sigrid is wondering, do you think that this has something to do with carp migrating to lower and colder parts of the lake at that time? Um, it could be where the organisms are moving over the um, season. Also, we don't know for sure whether or not that's going to be realized in our data. Uh, we haven't processed any of our carp data well enough to know if that's a trend that we'll notice. Um, it can also be other things that have to do with PCR inhibitors that show up in midsummer that we haven't looked at either. So there's other variables that we still have to um, take a look at. Okay. Can you talk about the cost differences between dry versus wet sample collection and processing? Well, that's hard because it rolls into um, personnel time, not just supplies as well. Um, I'd say that the difference between the desiccant kits and the water sample grabs is probably um, probably about equivalent. You have to buy the stuff for the kits. You have to buy stuff for the water grabs. You have to do the filtering at some point, whether you're in a boat or you're back at a lab bench. Um, and then they're handled the same way after that. The extraction method is the same and qPCR method is the same. So they're probably pretty similar in cost. The only thing that um, I think that you gain in the difference between the water grabs and the desiccant kits is the different ways you could use the desiccant sampling method that you couldn't with a water grab, such as you know going through the boundary waters um, or having places where you can't get these water samples to a cooler where they stay cold for 48 hours. And then and then get your filtering done. So um, the desiccant kits allow us to have more options for sampling different places or remote places, or sending things through the mail is another um, another good option for that. Price wise, I don't know that it's going to be much more than five to ten dollars different for the desiccant kits. Um, by the time you put all the little pieces together. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the next question um, was, do eDNA methods, e methods work in river or stream systems? Yep. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's where I've read that some of the kind of the early work on aquatic organisms was happening in river systems for either invasives or um, rare fish species. So yeah, some of the foundational stuff happened in rivers. Um, so these next couple questions sort of relate to the continuation project. And we should answer those, but I did want to also just call call attention to um, at 3.15 to 4, we're doing the new Maester Project's lightning talks. And Josh is going to be giving a little more detail about that continuation work. Um, Oh, that's from the Rusty Crayfish Project. Oh, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> my mistake. Um, so the question is, when will test kits be available? Um, and how do interested folks become part of the potential citizen science network? Um, and I will, I'll answer that second one. I'll put my email in the chat um, 
I think Josh mentioned that the, that part doesn't really officially kick off until January. So you might not see that much quite yet, but um, I'm happy to start maintaining a list and, and building that network. It's never, never hurts to get started on that soon. So I'll defer to the test kit to you guys. Yeah. So there's going to be a couple of months of in-house method optimization it, to figure out what the kit is going to be. So we're going to test different pump and hose systems that hook up to this Smith Root filter housing. Uh, make sure that we find something that is going to be easy to use, low risk of contamination. So we don't want water to backwash, you know, into the filter. Um, we're going to test some things out and, and pick something that works. Once the once we're ready to start recruiting, that is going to be um, you know before summer hits. But it's from our list of twenty lakes that we've included in this project because we want to have a known invasive species um, status in the lakes that we're sending volunteers to sample and a history of how our, our eDNA sampling uh, panned out the year before so that we have something to gauge how well citizen uh, or community member samples are, are generating data and if they're comparable to data that, that we ourselves were generating. So the recruitment of volunteers is gonna be from a, the subset of 20 lakes in Minnesota that we have included in this project. Okay. Um, there was a really good question earlier on. I want to go back to that just in case folks missed it. But the um, question was about that 95% level um, confidence for detection. Um, and she's asking, since this is a screening process, would it be better to set the level higher, like to aim for 99% so that nothing is missed? Um, and the other, her other question is about the specificity. How likely is it that a positive result is due to actual presence of that AIS. And I know Chris answered this, but it'd be, it'd be good to share this in case folks weren't watching the Q&A. Yeah, Chris, do you Josh, want to you talk? I just, Go ahead. yeah, for sure. Um, so for that 95%, um, as I kind of said if uh, in the um, question, uh, it's kind of like a, a arbitrary number that uh, scientists use a lot. And certainly, you know, you can set it much higher. Uh, it's pretty easy to do so. And I, I think it's a great point that uh, like when we're kind of looking for uh, new species and especially if we think, you know, uh, a lake is um, getting a lot of traffic or something like that um, from boaters that maybe we want to set that a little higher to take more water samples from that lake. Um, and then in terms of, uh, the kind of specificity, uh, like, um, so how likely is the positive result due to actually suspected AIS? Um, so this is kind of something that we are like actively thinking about. Uh, and me and Josh have talked about this a little bit, um, but certainly if we're having kind of uh, multiple detections from multiple lake visits, uh, I think that's really strong evidence that that uh, invasive species is in the lake. Um, so, you know, if we have just one random like sample uh, from the 50 samples that we take from a lake that is a hit, uh, you know, maybe there's like a boater that just zoomed past that has like zebra mussels all over the hull of their boat that, and they just put it in that lake or something like that, you know. Uh, which kind of might not indicate that uh, those AIS are actually present in the lake. Um, but that kind of like repeated observations, positive hits um, is, is going to um, indicate that those, uh, those species are present in the lake. And I'll add that um, at least for rusty crayfish, where we have other native crayfish in our lakes, we tested the primer and probe we were using to make sure it was specific to rusty crayfish, amplifying their DNA and not a, a native species. So we tested northern clearwater, calico, and um, bural crayfish, and the primers and probes did not cause any amplification in those three native crayfish. And so that was how we were confirming that we had a specific primer and probe set for rusty crayfish and we weren't getting accidental amplification from another species and thereby attributing that amplification to rusty crayfish. 
So that's the example I remember. I don't work in the lab, but I did work closely with that one because I was collecting crayfish for them and bringing them into the lab so that they could use those uh, tests of the primers and probes and make sure that they were specific to rusty crayfish. Okay, I think there's time for one question. Um, I don't know if it will be possible to answer this since we haven't really settled on a method for sure of the analysis or the collect sample collection, but they're asking if um, there's a general cost estimate per sample or per hundred samples. Oh boy. <laughs> so that that is not my, uh, I wouldn't be able to answer that to be honest. Um, somebody from our lab staff might know how to price things out like that because there's supplies, but there's people's time and there's consumables and all of that factors into a price per unit sample, but that price changes depending on how many samples you have. It becomes more efficient to run a larger batch of samples. So I don't know how to, how to answer that, to be honest. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I think what we can say is that the cost is coming down all the yeah. time um, and that the more that we can all kind of work together in a coordinated and systematic effort to like get whatever bulk pricing we can with the sampling supplies and the analysis will help make it more accessible and broaden the impact. Um, oh, one pretty beefy question, two minutes left. We'll, let's give it a shot. Um, <laughs> Drawing from medical epidemiologic, epidemiology and screening, it would be best to set the detection higher than the usual 95% level used in other scientific studies. The danger of a type 2 error missing an invasive is much worse than falsely identifying a lake as contaminated. In addition, the positive predictive value is critical, which means that the likelihood of a positive test being positive is very dependent on the incidence of the AIS. Quick response to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I guess I'll mention what we're trying to do in this project fundamentally is figure out when should you go out and collect water samples that overlap with the most species. And if you're going to go out and collect samples, there's many ways to do that. And there's many ways to process those samples. So which combination of when, where, and how maximize your chances of capturing DNA extracting it, amplifying it, and quantifying it. And that's basically what we're looking to do with this project. Um, I think that eDNA is going to probably be a screening tool for a while where any um, eDNA uh, only surveys will probably be followed up by traditional surveys to verify an organism is present. And so I, as a screening tool um, in the beginning, uh, that's kind of the best that I think we could do right now. I don't think we're to the point of just going out and doing only eDNA sampling and, and presenting all information that way yet. 